believe, and lots of you know what we're going to call games people. I'm doing air quotes. Games people um, believe, or, or, or arts people um, believe, is that the games already are culture. We, we're dealing with something that m many people would believe is uh, is an art form, right? Is, is is stuff of immense cultural value. Is stuff that touches people's lives, and yet broadly, it's often marketed as if it's you know like chicken nuggets. But more importantly, I think this is about video games taking their place and being encouraged to take their place, you know, as a platform through which people can express themselves, right? And it is our responsibility as parents and, for, and you know, and as custodians of trying to shape what we want, what we want games to be in the future, to help encourage that. Some point soon, some, you know, eight-year-old girl from Wells is gonna completely reinvent everything that we thought video games could be. It's hugely, hugely exciting. Hello, welcome to Family Gamer TV. Now, if you track with the channel, you know that we often look at games as cultural artifacts. We look at them as pieces of art. And recently, I've been reading on The Guardian uh, a feature written by Ian Simons that ends by saying, video games speak culture with ever increasing fluency. The problem is that cultural policy doesn't speak video games. Now that little nugget got me interested. So I've got in touch with Ian. We've got him here today to tell us more about this tension between video games and culture. So, so how did this piece come about, Ian? Uh, well, I direct the National Video Game Arcade, um, which has just celebrated its first birthday in Nottingham. And what we're trying to do is uh, celebrate and explore and interpret um, video games as as culture, as things that me that, that have a, a material and emotional meaning and you know resonance in, in people's lives. So. So interestingly, we spend you know all, all our time here um, with school trips or with families or with visitors. So hundreds, tens of thousands of people um, uh, every year come and, and experience games in their lives, often, often for the first time. And so prior to working in video games, and prior to directing a festival that I did before the, for the arcade, which is about games, um, I worked in in the arts, in, in theatre and music, and it always struck me as very, very strange. Um, how poor the, the games industry, and I, the problem is you start using quite general terms like industry, but actually in, in this sense I mean the kind of establishment um, was at participating in, in the rest of the world really, in, in, in culture. Um, and there's always been this kind of disconnect, and the cultural establishment has been um, pro probably wary and a bit elitist and a bit sniffy of inviting video games kind of into their world. And I say the kind of games industry has been partially paranoid, par sorry, paralysed by a kind of paranoia about not being cultural enough or not being valid enough. Um, and it sort of led to this um, over the years. I think this kind of uh, yeah, this, this this sort of paralysis between the two. So so we wanted to um, try and diffuse that, you know, in everything that we do and. One of the conversations I've been having recently that's been re really recurring with other festival directors or other commissioners of work is, well, you know, we, we are in a position now where we commission um, art. We might commission public art, we might commission music, we might commission dance. We'd like to commission uh, a video game, whatever that means, right? Now, the problem currently is that there's no um, particularly understood pathway within the cultural establishment for knowing what to do. So literally, if I was to decide um, as a commissioner that games are interesting, I'd like to commission a game, like who do, who do I call? Who do I ring up? How much does it cost? Do I need any chairs? How long will it take? You know, these, these kind of really pragmatic um, sort of case studies aren't really in place. So what we're trying to do with Continue, in association with the Arts Council, is begin to bridge that gap. So it's really about a, a, a couple of things. One of which is about literacy. So how do we talk about and share ideas about video games? How can we um, help the cultural establishment really broadly have some kind of shared and, and a, bro a broader breadth of um, a broader breadth, a broader breadth of reference points? Uh, so part of that is critical about developing a language with which um, people can talk about video games. But really importantly for us, another part of this is pragmatic. So it's really important that the, the continue event is about case study and it's about well, what do we do? How do we um, how do we build on a critical understanding to actually create and enable uh, new voices to enter games, new voices to new commissioners to commission games, um, and, and and allow them to participate 
more, more freely in what I guess we think of as being the sort of mainstream, you know, um, culturality. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an awful lot in that, what you've just said. Oh, so yeah, sorry. Starting to tweeze it apart, um, I mean, first of all, is there an appetite when, you, when you're sort of combining this conversation between video games communities and the arts communities? Is there an appetite? Is, there, is, is that well received when you try and do that? I mean, yes, you know, with, without a doubt. That wasn't necessarily always the case. And, and so the, the problem with this and the tension um, within this is, I believe, and lots of, you know, what we're going to call games people, I'm doing air quotes, games people um, believe, or, or, or arts people um, believe, is that the games already are culture because they're already in, like incredibly mainstream. They're already consumed by lots of different kinds of people. So on one hand, this feels like a kind of sort of bit of a moot point, but we need, we like, you know, in order to um, to have this conversation, like some some generalisation is, is kind of necessary. So, um, a lot of people who make video games now, and, and I think um, this is probably true of everybody in the sector, particularly without wishing to characterise you know the kind of like the interesting indie sector as you know as big, but like more more culturally anyway than necessarily the kind of AAA developers. Um, there is an appetite and there is a set of references and a set of concerns and a set and a breadth of things that games can do um, which speaks to a uh, I, I guess a sort of human and sort of cultural agenda rather than just a uh, what we might historically thought of as being a you know, like a video game store agenda right so they can begin to be about different things they can begin to be about our lives in different ways um, and that's what you know that's what culture's about that's what um culture funding is about about giving different perspectives on our lives and, and you know, different i don't want really to like terribly uh grandiose about this but you know but different perspectives on what it means to, to to be human right so um so when you look at the amount of you know human time um human consciousness that's put into video games it's ludicrous right that um the culture sector wouldn't be um, looking at this and thinking about how it can support and fund and make more meaning um, from this from this incredible asset, this incredible kind of intellectual and creative asset that it's got in people who make video games. So I think there really is an appetite. What there isn't are a lot of shared uh, reference points so far, because the games sector, like broadly, um, has been quite bad at inviting non-gamers into it. Um, and and, so, you know, and, the, and the same is true of a lot of the culture sector too, right? Um, so so that's really what what we certainly what we try to do in the NBA and, and with the festival and then um, with continue is I guess approach this at uh, a policy level um, as well as uh, I guess a sort of consumer level. Yeah, and it's from I mean as a consumer, and I know many parents will be listening and, and thinking, well, that all sounds great, but the, the games my kids play seem largely about shooting people in the head and, and entertainment. Um, how do you get from there to a, a, a broader sort of diet of, of games? Is, is that is that the sort of the end game? Well, this is about you know this is about those parents equipping and inspiring um, their daughters, uh, their sons, um, to uh, to think of the video game and to think of you know the things that they might be studying school as like as, as a means to. As a means to express themselves, you know, it's their responsibility to to widen the breadth of, of, of the things that video games can be about and encourage them to enter that. Like, you know, if, if you're, we we need to we need to broaden everybody's palette in terms of what's available, and you know, and, and we need to uh, to make people aware like better of the extraordinary breadth of work that already exists that people wouldn't necessarily come across. But more importantly, I think this is about video games taking their place and being encouraged to take their place, you know, as a platform through which people can express themselves, right? So um, if your kid is interested in music, you know, you can buy him a ukulele, okay? And he can learn to play. They might be really good at that. And they could join a band in school. They could begin to learn ultimately like how to how to express what it means to be him or herself through that, okay? Uh, video games apps unquestionably also have that um, have that power, right? Um, but they're not thought of in the same breath at the moment. They're not necessarily thought of as being 
uh, kind of cultural expressive sort of ap apparatus, you know. Um, and they are, they absolutely, it's ludicrous. You know, we don't think when we use, you know, Microsoft Word to write the next great American novel with that we're using a computer to do that with. That doesn't in some way impede it. It's just crazy that we should think of that, um, the, the, uh, video games as a, you know, as a sort of creative lens or a creative engine would some way make something less creative. Um, so, so yeah, you know, if, if, if their kid at home is playing things that largely looks like space marines shooting other space marines, um, I can wholly understand and, 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 and sympathise and or celebrate that. Um, but there is a breadth of material out there and it is our responsibility as parents and, you know, and as custodians of trying to shape what we want what we want games to be in the future to help encourage that. So the great intervention that the culture sector can take, I think, um, is in encouraging new voices to make new kinds of video games. This is the same thing that happened with VHS in the 80s, you know, where suddenly kids at home um, could make their own movies, right? So from that, we got a whole new breed of independent filmmaker who learned their trade um, by, by making home movies at home on VHS. We're now in that position with video games, which is really, really exciting, um, that the tools to make them um, are, 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 are free, largely, are, are so accessible that actually what you need is, is, is time and an intent to learn, uh, and, I, and I guess a, um, a, you, know, you know, an idea and skill and something to express, and that's really exciting, you know, because that means that different people are going to make different games about different things, and at some point soon, some, you know, eight-year-old girl from Wells is going to completely reinvent everything that we thought video games could be. It's hugely, hugely exciting. It is really exciting, isn't it? Um, but what, I, what it makes me wonder is, do, have other art forms needed this sort of like campaign behind them to say actually they are meaningful? Like, is there not a case to say if they're culturally significant, culture will notice and then they will become unavoidable and it will happen. We don't necessarily need to champion them. Or is there something peculiar about the stage that games are at that we that we need to take action in this way? Um, so certainly in the UK, um, the video game sector, and I'm like I'm trying to choose my words carefully because I, like I do genuinely feel that things are getting really better. I don't. This is I'm not starting a I'm not starting a campaign. I'm trying to create a you know, a sort of punctuation mark, a long, a longer spectrum of narrative, which is definitely improving, you know? Um, so I, do, I don't think this is an, you know, we're in an apocalyptic scene for video games or any, anything of the sort. Um, but I think that the games industry, the mainstream games industry, certainly in the UK, has become, or became like really quite entrenched um, for quite a long time and quite defensive totally understandably because it was getting you know we'd be getting kicked around in the right wing media when everything kind of went wrong um and became unable to express its cultural worth in anything other than um fiscal terms right so um gta 5 sold more units than any other piece of entertainment media that you know that year ever ergo um, it must be culture, right? Because it's massive, because everybody's playing it, so it definitely must be culture. And like, and like it is, right? But that doesn't, that doesn't help to um, give people an entry point into what GTA means. That's really good for, you know, for Take-Two shareholders. And, that, and that's important, I'm not denigrating that. That's really important, it's people's jobs, of course that's important. But it doesn't help people understand and embed what, uh, what GTA might kind of meet, like mean to them. So the GTA is an example of like right at that end of the spectrum. We could talk about things um, that were much smaller that were kind of impacting people's lives um, that haven't entered uh, yet quite really um, the mainstream cultural uh, conversation. So I think because games were sort of, sort of in, like, kind of self impeded a little bit um, by getting probably bigger than they ever expected or intended to be faster than they expected to. You know, and, and, and its acceleration into being um, a, you know, like a globalized industry was, was really, really fast. So the, you know, the kind of language that built up around them, and I guess the sort of, uh, the marketing language that built up around them for several decades is really like, you know, that we're dealing with something that mo many people would believe is, uh, is an art form. Right, is, is, is stuff of immense cultural value, is stuff that touches people's lives, and yet, broadly, it's often marketed as if it's, you know, like chicken nuggets. 
Um, so the, you know, the, the way in which it, um, uh, it is allowed to intersect with people who might want to talk about it is, is, is sometimes like auto-trivializing, you know. I sound like a terrible like media studies lecturer. I'm not even a media studies lecturer. Like I'm saying this stuff and I hate myself saying it. All I'm really saying is um, they are often more interesting um, than they're allowed to be by the industry that surrounds them, you know. And, and that's, um, that's where I think um, a more sympathetic and understanding cultural policy around it could be really helpful. Hmm. Well, perhaps we could um, end by looking at some specific games. Um, one I was keen to talk about was a game called That Dragon Cancer. So from my perspective, it, it felt like that was a game that was obviously coming with a sort of a cultural payload. It was more than just entertainment and um, the, the setup is around a family whose son um, is diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and the, the game unfolds from there. Um, what I was interested about was it did seem to get quite a lot of broad coverage in sort of cultural pages in the newspapers and on television. Um, is that a success story or, or do you think that still, you know, that still is reflective of where we are in terms of how we talk about games? Um, so the... Which, again, I try and choose my words carefully. Um, so, that Dragon Cancer um, journey, flower games, which I know, like I know, you're familiar, and you've, you've done work with, with these kind of games too. Um, the the slight danger with all of these titles, which are amazing, um, is that they can often become the sort of muscle memory, you know culture games that we um, that we sort of refer to whenever we're called upon to go, oh no, the games are actually kind of arty, you know, they're, they're not just all about this, because what about what about Journey, what about Fly, what about, what about Drug and Cancer? Um, and so, so, yeah, so yes, clearly, all of those um, three titles do something, I think, very profound uh, and very provocative in terms of demonstrating the breadth of uh, of, of, of theme, uh, breadth of, of, of different kinds of design, really different kinds of design vocabulary that games can um, that games can address. Um, I think the opportunity, um, and, and I think that the, the sort of nuance in that is that where are the games that begin, or people are aware of at least, that begin to speak to, if you like, a kind of like more kind of urbane um, end of culture. Do you know what I mean? So where's like the you know um, the sort of Mike Lee or if you like, not even Mike Lee? Where's the kind of EastEnders of this? Where's the where where are the moments that um, of, of this that might begin to I, I guess sort of touch our lives in ways that aren't like necessarily at the extremity of um, of emotion? Although um, that isn't at all to denigrate any of those games, um, but culture like it doesn't. It's tempting to fall into that Spielberg quote, right? The games will be art when they make you cry, which is, like, which is ludicrous. Okay, yeah. there's a whole load of emotions that you can have as well as crying that are, you know, that are meaningful and profound, um, and, and 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 equally say something about um, about what it is to be, you know, what it is to be a person, right? Um, and and the temptation is to look to those examples that are right at the um, at the at the, at the amazing amazing pieces of work at the end of that sort of spectrum. I guess one of the things I'm interested in doing, particularly at the conference, is drawing things back as well to um, thinking about how games can address other kinds of experience, other kinds of um, other kinds of, like other kinds of meaning. Really, do, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Like it's tempting to dive towards the you know. Yeah, the, yeah. It's like they can become the sort of poster child or. You know, games are art because because this exists. But I, what I was actually more interested in was how they had been received, and just the fact that um, that Dragon Cancer had had seemed to have been on the radar of quite a lot of cultural writers. Um, I was wondering if that is, like, you know, I was saying, is that a success in those terms or just an exception? Um, I mean, I say, so, in, in terms of coverage, I mean, it's, it seems that it has raised the consciousness of the idea of games being able to address and express like, a, like a, some, some different um, kinds of emotion, kinds of themes. So that feels like that's been, that's been a success, you know, absolutely. Um, it, I, I guess it, 
so I'm not I'm not familiar with the, like the, you know all, all the breadth of coverage about it. So I don't know how much that was like true, just kind of being anomalous to what video games should normally be, and that's what defines it, or whether that was actually okay. So this is a brave new language that video games can do. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I, like I, I couldn't really comment on that, but it feels to me like a um, a really important m moment in um, in the story of what video games can um, can can be and can do. Not least. Um, because of the presence of the authors within the story of what that game is, you know. So this, you know, the story of that dragon cancer makes uh, um, like me mean meaning of itself and, and and makes meaning of what games can do only really with the presence of um, that process and you know, that and that awful situation that the, you know, the developers were in. But it's that. The like the humanity of the presence of the artists who made that game is 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 really is really central to that, and that's what I think makes it so important. And it was so important that they were part of that story in the um, in the in the, in the coverage around it. And I know one of the things you do um, is this thing called the Game City Prize, where you pick some games each year and you get. Well, from the outsider, you seem to get the wrong people to judge these games. Yes, we <laughs> insist on being, about games. Absolutely, we, we, we absolutely insist on work? being the wrong people. So, so the point of the Game City Prize, um, we, we, we run this festival called Game City for, well now for 10 years, but I think it was seven or eight years when we started doing the prize. And and we'd never done a prize. A festival should have prizes, right? It's the, ob like it's the obvious thing for a festival to do. But we didn't want to, we wanted to do something with that, to make it kind of mean something other than what's the best, you know, what, what, what's the best game. Um, so, so our, our idea was to construct a prize for video games that was judged largely by non-gamers. Um, that would its function would be to generate com new conversations with different people talking about video games. So the idea was we'd get six or seven jurors who will be people that you'd heard of who are culturally curious. And we're interested in video games that come from really diverse backgrounds. So they might be musicians or architects or you know writers or or comic book makers or actors or like people working in that kind of world um, who were just interested in what games could be. Uh, and we would give them six or seven games, and we'd give them the games in June with all the hardware. Some of them had never had game hardware before, and they you know they'd go into their homes, they'd play the games throughout the summer. So it's you know it's a lot, it's a longer burning process. And then they would meet up um, in the autumn and argue um, about which game they thought was the best on the terms that they decided in the room. So really, so uh, you know, uh, uh, Flappy Bird could go up against you know Bioshock, right? It was it was it was sort of it was kind of will, like willfully um, provocative and the sort of thing that you know you'd stay up arguing about if, if, if you're a kid. But there's no there's no real winner. It's not really about who wins. Um, it's about the conversation that gets you there. So we'd have people like like Peter Gabriel, Darren Aronofsky, and Charlie Hickson, and uh, Dave Gibbons, with you really uh, like a bunch of like amazing jurors who would often for the first time encounter um, video games in their homes. Um, is 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 sometimes very very positive, or usually very very positive. Or, but get the whole gamut of what it means to suddenly, you know, to, to install a console and to have these things in your front room for the first time, um, and then talk about it. So what it, what actually began as a conversation about six video games really, really rapidly becomes a conversation about, but I've opened the box, I've plugged the Xbox in, and it says I've got to download, you know, three hours of up. That, what, you know, what what do I do now? You know, and we so we we end up having doing like set up help desks to help people set up the um, do home visits, to help people set up the consoles, because the experience of playing video games is it, it's really interesting to go through that with someone for the first time. So it's, it's easy to forget what that was like, you know, because because the amount of skills that you you know that one has acquired over decades of fixing this stuff and tolerating this stuff. Um, is it you know you kind of think it's okay that it doesn't do anything for like an hour and a half and it goes out of the box, um, but for someone who's just encountered this for the first time, this seems insane. What's it doing? Why isn't it? What? This? Uh, what is happening? You know, this is a consumer object. Um, so that all that stuff is part of the world of them is is really really interesting, um, and that's what that's what that's what we do with the Game C Prize. So we're going to start that again this year. 
we almost get the jury together. Um, and it's about, again, the driving much more broadly the conversation of video games as culture. And really the provocation for us and the sort of kickback we got from the games community was, well, like who gets to say which games are good? And um, yeah, who, who has control of Game of the Year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, who, who, who gets to say? And um, I don't know the answer. Um, it's certainly not me. Uh, but our, our kind of our provocation was, well, maybe it's these six interesting people who get, who get to decide that. Like, that's interesting. Because they're going to come up with quite a different perspective um, just on what the experience of having the games were than, you know, six Harvard games store. So just finally, I'm I'm off to an arts festival called Greenbelt in August, and we'll, I'll be talking to um, some people who don't play games, and probably on this sort of topic. And so what would you say to them? You know, how do, how do we get them from where they are? Probably with kids who play the odd game. What what should they do to enter this world and sort of embrace the more sort of culturally interesting world, world of, games. of games? Um. Well, I think they need, in all honesty, I think they need a guide. Um, so, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, we now run a uh, museum experience visitor attraction called the National Video Game Arcade. Um, so we have hundreds of people coming around here experiencing games for the first time they play every week. By design, um, a critical part of the design of this um, of this whole place is the presence of, of kind of docents of, of crew, of people who will help you. Um, find find your way uh, uh, to kind of explain. I wonder what that's kind of explaining how games might work, but also explaining which games might be for you. Um, and I don't think you can you can really shortcut that, to be honest, because the barriers to entry to playing a game can be really high. You know, um, so we, we we often will encounter people who've, ne- who've never held a controller before, right? So imagine you've never held um, a dual shot controller, someone handed it to you for the first time. Yes. They're really complicated things. Like, there's how many buttons on this thing, and you can turn it around, and you can, like, that's a really fragile moment. You know, there's a point where someone hasn't held a controller before, and there's a point where they have, and that needs to be. If you don't get that right, um, they're going to walk away from that thinking that this is this isn't for me. This is like I don't have a motor skill. It's too complicated. This just this just projects you know complexity at me, right? So. Um, that like we put a lot of emphasis here on the the human face of that of that first moment or that first encounter with any of the games in it and helping you kind of understand what it is. So, so, so and that and that turns into you know a kind of into a games literacy, right? So um, in the we have a bar here, and in the evenings we'll have different games out to play. But we also have a kind of game sommelier. So if you come in, you don't really know what you want to play, but maybe it's a puzzle game. But there's two of you, so maybe you know, and they'll help you select a game from our library, and you can play that, or we'll try something else. And and like it, like normalising and kind of embedding uh, a, a kind of games literacy in um, in the world through conversation is is I think the only way. Um, the only real way this can work. So there, you know, there are websites we can look at, and there are journalists who, you know, champion um, um, new, new, new games, or can kind of point out more interesting things to play too. But I think it's that um, there's n- there's nothing to beat. I don't think um, another person um, illuminating what's happening um, in front of you. Um, I don't, you know, I don't like snooker. You know, I don't really get it. But I've been with people who really do, who can, and the best commentators can, you know, can illuminate this thing that's happening and, and really bring it to life. And suddenly it's the most profound and beautiful thing in the world, right? And that's true, and that's true of many things, but it often gets lost, I think, with um, uh, with game culture, which is which is a tragedy, really, because it's such a rich, you know, a rich and exciting place. Okay. Yeah, I like that. They need a guide. I think I've used the phrase, they need a need a priest in the good sense of the word someone who creates a space for them to discover for themselves rather than dictate and just has and the feeling that you have like a map or something like a map and then permission to do that and I don't think games have necessarily in the past always been great at making everybody feel like they've got permission to play well that's that's all you know it's fascinating stuff I'm going to go back and chew over this conversation I think um, uh, but thanks for your time I really appreciate it thank you